Today on Brief History, we discuss the first woman to be crowned as Sovereign Queen of England. Following in the shadow of her famous father and persevering during the reign of her younger brother, she would overcome all odds to cut her difficult path to the throne. Her time as queen would see a return to tradition, international war, an unfortunate loss, and an undeniably terrible persecution. Join me as I take a brief look at Bloody Mary, remembered today as Queen Mary I of England. Mary was born on February 18, 1516, at Greenwich Palace in England. She was the daughter of the famous King Henry VIII of England, and her mother was Catherine of Aragon. She would be the only living child between her parents, but would have two half-siblings, which will be discussed shortly. Mary was given her own household from birth, which included women and men, and included several rockers. A reflection on Mary's early life, and indeed her entire life, requires a certain degree of context, specifically context with regard to her parents' marriage slash relationship. Mary's mother was a Spanish princess who had initially married Mary's paternal uncle, Prince Arthur Tudor, Mary's father, Henry VIII's elder brother. However, Prince Arthur would die before he could inherit the throne, and therefore, Mary's mother would be betrothed to her father, who, after his elder brother's death, became the heir to the throne of England himself. Although steps were taken to give Mary's father other options for marriage, he would, after becoming king, choose to marry her mother. The marriage was initially a happy one, but unfortunately, beginning in 1510, Mary's mother Catherine began suffering miscarriages. Between 1510 and 1515, at least three miscarriages and stillborns were recorded before Mary's birth in 1516. Although her birth was surely a relief to her parents, there still remained a problem in that Mary was female. England at the time had never been ruled by a woman in her own right, and thus Mary's father was keen on producing a son to inherit the kingdom. Although Mary's parents would continue to attempt to have children, they would be unsuccessful in this, and thus the relationship between the two soon began to deteriorate. The relationship between Mary's parents is something we will return to. Although the relationship between Mary and her father as she became older would be a negative one, something we will shortly touch on, in her youth, Mary was doted on by her father, who often paraded her around court and referred to her as his token of hope. Recent reflections on Mary and her education have tended to conclude that Mary was not educated well and may have been quite daft and simple. But it has been argued that, as were her half-siblings, Mary was educated well and was greatly influenced by her mother. She had multiple mentors slash tutors, but two stick out to many, a Spanish humanist named Juan Luis Vives, and a Cambridge tutor named Richard Featherstone. Mary was believed to have taken her studies, which included much reading, learning by heart, studying Latin, French, and sections of the Bible, seriously. Although information may have been readily available to the young Mary, her intellectual ability or desire to pick up on this information is still disputed, and it should be noted that due to the strict gender roles at that time, a time which had not yet seen a queen rule in her own right, much of her education was geared towards the traditional roles for women, and that she was not pushed towards the typical masculine roles, which included studies that would benefit one as a leader. Vives specifically, even possibly knowing that Mary could become queen one day, was still dedicated to instructing her in the traditional feminine roles of the 16th century, including chastity, piety, and humility. Therefore, many are of the belief that this would have made her unsuitable, in theory, for a leadership role. Although we can never know if Mary was truly simple-minded or unprepared for her future role, it can be argued that she at the very least had access to education and information that few women in that time would have had access to. However, by 1525, Vive's influence began to decline, for reasons we will discuss shortly. Although we know that Mary would be the only child between her parents, up to the age of nine years old, Mary's parents assumed they would produce a son at some point, and thus Mary was used, as was expected in that time, as a political tool through marriage. In 1518, with the famous Universal Peace Treaty known as the Treaty of London, a provision was put in place that would have saw Mary married to the Dauphin of France, at the time Francis III, eventual Duke of Brittany. However, this was not taken very seriously, 
When her cousin Charles I of Spain was elected Holy Roman Emperor in 1519, and war was on the horizon once again with France, Mary was betrothed to Charles, who was 16 years her senior. In the meantime, Mary was sent to the Welsh marches, but not designated as the Princess of Wales, which would have confirmed her position as the heir to the throne. Her father was still very aware that England had not ever seen a woman rule in her own right, and that with Mary's betrothal to Emperor Charles, if he were to die, England would become part of the Habsburg Empire. This was something that Mary's father found difficult to accept, and thus kept his options open. Moving Mary to the Welsh marches most likely also had the added benefit of removing her from her mother. Little is known of Mary's time in the West, although it is believed that she most likely continued her strict education. Mary's time on tour, however, would soon come to an abrupt end. After Emperor Charles V's glorious victory at Pavia in 1525, in which the French king was captured, he abandoned his marriage betrothal to Mary and instead married elsewhere. Mary was then recalled in 1526, and after Emperor Charles snubbed Mary's father's attempts to carve up France after the Emperor's victory, Mary's father began negotiation with the French, which would see Mary offered again as part of a marriage deal to now the French King Francis I. After inspection, Mary was observed still to be too young, small, and frail, and thus it would eventually be agreed that Mary would marry Francis's son, Charles, Duke of Orléans. But the same issues existed with the French marriage as did with an imperial marriage, and the thought of England coming under control of a foreign power was not acceptable not only to Mary's father, but to much of the nobility as well. When Mary was around 13 years old in 1529, things took a dramatic and unfortunate turn for her. Her mother now found it impossible to conceive, and Mary's father, being the egotistical and harsh man that he was, unsurprisingly began to find solace in other women, specifically a woman named Anne Boleyn. Mary's childhood had been seemingly normal for an English princess, but now everything was to change as her father now incredibly began seeking a divorce from her mother. Up to 1529, Mary remained a welcome visitor at court. She remained betrothed to the French Duke of Orléans, but nothing could come of this until at least 1533 when she reached the age of cohabitation. It is believed that she spent much of her time doing needlework, studying, and playing music, but mostly kept to herself. By April 1531, Mary fell ill for three weeks, and it is believed that she had developed a severe menstrual disorder. But this sickness was most certainly made worse by the stress that she was surely experiencing due to the deterioration of her parents' relationship. Mary was no longer allowed any contact with her mother, someone who had been a great comfort to her in the past, although it has been argued that Mary's father's enforcement of this was weak, perhaps intentionally. Technically, Mary's relationship with her father remained the same, but in reality, Mary leaned heavily in her mother's favor. Anne Boleyn had fully taken Mary's father's attention by that point, and some at the time argued that Anne hated Mary. By late 1531, Mary's potential husband, the Duke of Orléans, was married off to someone else, once again removing a future husband for her. But bigger problems existed for Mary by this time. Mary and both her parents had been Orthodox practicing Catholics up to this point. However, with the strong desire to marry Anne Boleyn and produce a male heir, Mary's father began seeking a divorce from her mother. But when the Pope in Rome refused to grant a divorce to Mary's father based in part on Catholic doctrine and in part on imperial influence, he would start a long and complex process, which would include flirting with Protestantism, to break free from the Catholic Church. Incredibly, through piecemeal parliamentary legislation, coercion, and political maneuvering, Mary's father would be successful in this endeavor. By 1534, he, through the famous Act of Supremacy, had declared himself as the supreme head of the Church of England and broke free from Catholic influence. A newly appointed Archbishop of Canterbury with Protestant leanings, a man named Thomas Cranmer, had already been installed as Archbishop and had declared Mary's parents' marriage null and void in 1533. Mary's father had, in fact, already married Anne Boleyn bigamously, and Anne was already pregnant by that time. Although Mary's mother would put up a tremendous fight and defend her right as queen, she and her allies in the end would be defeated. Mary's mother's household was reduced, and she was essentially put on house arrest with Mary being forbidden from visiting her. Again, it is important to note that although visitation was strictly prohibited, communication was believed to be sent between Mary and her mother, even with her father's blessing at times. Mary's father, despite ruthlessly removing her mother from the equation, 
hesitated with how to proceed with his daughter and hoped that he could convince her to accept the situation by showing her favor. However, by September 1533, when Mary was 21, Anne Boleyn gave birth to Mary's half-sister, a girl named Elizabeth. Thus, it was crucial that Elizabeth be declared legitimate. Mary was demoted from Princess Mary to Lady Mary and declared illegitimate shortly thereafter. Her household was also reduced, but she was still treated relatively generously. However, it is believed that Mary's father had believed that she had submitted to the new arrangement, and the generosity that was being shown to her was contingent upon this. A commission was sent to her, which required her to cease using the title of princess. Not only did Mary refuse this, but sent a strongly worded letter to her father, disapproving of the situation. Her father was outraged. Soon her entire establishment was dissolved, and she, along with her servants, were absorbed by her half-sister Elizabeth's establishment. Over the next two years, Mary was her own worst enemy. She became extremely difficult and began to demonstrate against her situation via bursts of anger and rage, having to be physically restrained at times. She was particularly hostile, perhaps understandably, towards the new queen, Anne Boleyn, whenever she came to visit Elizabeth. Since an act of succession had been passed in 1534, declaring the children of Anne Boleyn to be heirs, Mary's actions were technically treasonous, but her father put up with this and refused to allow the law to be administered to his ex-wife or daughter. Mary was not treated particularly harshly or brutally, being allowed to exercise, ride, walk, etc., although she surely experienced serious stress, not only due to the new forced arrangements, but also to the afflictions she suffered with regard to her menstrual issues. Mary and her mother were supported by Mary's cousin and former fiancé, Emperor Charles. She did not take this lightly and was thankful to him for the support he had given them, as Charles was, unsurprisingly, against the English royal divorce and break with Rome. She even went as far as writing to the emperor and was alleged to have declared that he was her real father and that she would not marry without his advice first. This was another example of treasonous behavior. By 1535, Mary's mother became seriously ill and died in early 1536. Despite Mary's pleas, her father would not allow her to visit her dying mother, something that devastated the 19-year-old girl. With her mother out of the picture, her father and Anne Boleyn surprisingly became more generous towards her, as they were under the belief that Mary was simply being misled by her mother, and now that her mother was no longer around, she would finally submit and cease her unruly behavior. But this was not to be the case, and she failed to pick up on the positive vibes being sent her way. However, major changes soon were to take place that could, in theory, have helped Mary's position. After the birth of Elizabeth, Anne Boleyn had found it difficult to conceive and had suffered a miscarriage. Mary's father soon found that Anne was becoming a liability and therefore was easily convinced of her infidelity by her enemies. She was arrested and executed by beheading in 1536. Mary's father quickly remarried to a woman named Jane Seymour, and Elizabeth was quickly bastardized along with Mary. Jane Seymour and her family were, unlike Anne Boleyn, who had reformist tendencies, conservative with regard to religion, and thus possible allies to Mary and her supporters. Mary felt that her cause had been won, and that she would now return to the favor that was once shown to her as a child. But her father had no intention of abandoning the royal supremacy that he had worked towards in the years prior, and it soon became clear that if Mary was to be restored to favor, it would be on his terms and not because her legitimacy had been restored. Her father's position with regard to her reinstatement and return to favor remained the same as it was before, accept the royal supremacy and accept her own illegitimacy, but there was no chance of her being deemed as legitimate again. Mary attempted to write to her father and generally accept some of her offenses, but this sidestepping and reservation did not have the effect she hoped. Her father did not reply, and instead, a set of articles of submission were drawn up to be presented to her where no reservations could be implied. When a commission arrived and demanded that Mary repudiate the Pope, aka the Bishop of Rome as he was referred to in England, accept the royal supremacy and the nullity of her parents' marriage, she refused. She was now publicly guilty of treason on two counts, and her father was counseled to take legal action against her. This time, whether it was true or not, Mary was convinced that her father would take action against her and feared that she would be executed. It is said that for days, Mary suffered greatly from stress-related symptoms, including insomnia. Finally, after execution was allegedly threatened, she submitted. She was alleged to have been beside herself with grief for betraying her principles, 
but she was nevertheless relieved. The fact that the new queen, Jane Seymour, was much closer to Mary in age and of Catholic leaning lightened the blow somewhat, and the two became friends. News of Mary's rehabilitation spread quickly, and many thought this would mean a return to the line of succession. But other than her rehabilitation being slowly put into place, nothing much else happened. Soon her new establishment was in place, and there were renewed talks of marriage with the Portuguese and French. Although, as we will see, Mary would attempt to undo much of what her father had done in the years past, it appeared that by August of 1536, Mary had fully and genuinely converted to her father's point of view. She began referring to Elizabeth as her sister, something she had refused to do in the past and would find it difficult to do in the future. She spent Christmas at court with her father and Queen Jane in what is believed to be a peaceful time for her. By 1537, however, Queen Jane Seymour was pregnant, and unfortunately, the birth was a difficult one. She gave birth to Mary's half-brother, a boy christened Edward, to which Mary stood as godmother. But shortly thereafter, Jane died of complications. Mary's father was to marry three more times in the coming years. The first marriage was a disastrous one to Anne of Cleves, whom he swore off after their first night together and soon divorced. Although Mary was said to have treated Anne kindly later in life, not much is to be said of their relationship. The next marriage was to the unfortunate Catherine Howard in 1540. Mary was said to have been of a different temperament than Catherine and did not particularly get on well with her, being so close in age. Catherine Howard would be executed after adulterous accusations were proved to be true. She was also executed by beheading. In 1543, Henry married for the final time to a woman named Catherine Parr. Mary and Catherine were said to have had a positive relationship even before Catherine was in consideration to be Mary's father's next wife, despite Catherine's Protestant leanings. The act of supremacy and the break with the Catholic Church left the door open for discussions with regard to religion in England. Protestantism had been spreading for some time, and there were still disagreements over this in England. However, with the passing of the Act of Six Articles, the conservative Catholics in England seemingly scored a major victory, as much of the traditional slash Catholic ways were to be maintained and observed. Despite this, Henry grew disillusioned with his Catholic counselors as he aged, and it has been argued moved ever closer to Protestantism. Mary's faith with regard to this issue had always been considered conventional and within the parameters of the law. This is something that will come up again soon in Mary's story. Mary's half-brother, Prince Edward, the son of Jane Seymour, obviously as a legitimate male son, became heir to the Kingdom of England, and with the Act of Succession in 1536, Elizabeth was bastardized, as discussed previously. But in 1544, Mary's father made adjustments to the succession in case Edward was to die childless. The Act of Succession of 1544 declared that if Edward was not to produce any children, that Mary would then inherit the throne, followed by Elizabeth if Mary were to not produce any children. In the event that none of his children produced heirs, the crown would fall to his younger sister Mary Brandon's lineage. It should be noted, however, that neither Mary nor Elizabeth were legitimated despite them being acknowledged in the succession. In 1547, Mary's father died, and thus the 31-year-old Mary was second in line to succession behind her 9-year-old half-brother. It was time for a new incredible chapter in Mary's life. After her father's death in early 1547, Mary was finally free to manage her estates on her own. The provisions made by her father for the estates she was to inherit was generous, and when all was said and done, she would become one of the richest people in the realm, inheriting somewhat of a power base in East Anglia, which included the castle of Framlingham and the great house of Kenningall. Because much of these estates had been seized from pro-Catholic individuals who had fallen out of favor with her father prior to his death, Mary was also able to inherit a group of quasi-supporters with her estates, which, as we will see shortly, would be a very important aspect. What Mary could not do, however, was choose her husband, as her father had clearly made provisions for this before he died. That power now laid with her brother's counsel. Although through English law, Edward was legitimate heir and Mary illegitimate, to many in Catholic Europe it was the other way around. Although some, including the emperor, withheld acceptance of Edward until it was clear there was not pushback, 
In the end, there was no problems with the nine-year-old Edward becoming king, and he was duly crowned as Edward VI in February 1547 when Mary was 31 years old. Both Mary and Elizabeth attended the coronation. Of course, Edward was too young to immediately take control, and thus government needed to be ran by a group of counselors set up by Mary's father. One of the men who would play a major part in Edward's kingship was his maternal uncle, Edward Seymour, who was made Duke of Somerset, as well as the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, who was the man who had declared Mary's parents' marriage null and void. As we will see, Mary will find herself in serious turmoil when her brother became king, as her brother and his counselors were of the Protestant belief and soon began implementing serious religious change in England. Many heretical books and ideas began being allowed in the kingdom, despite the pushback from some of the more conservative bishops, specifically a man named Stephen Gardner, Bishop of Winchester. Gardner pointed out that the changes that were being seen were in direct conflict with the Act of Six Articles that had been passed during Mary's father's reign, and Mary was inclined to agree. It is important to note, however, that the arguments against what was happening at this point were not in the pursuit of a restoration of papal authority, but instead were on the ground of adhering to Mary's father's settlement with regard to the church. The heretical ideas and books were nevertheless allowed by the protector, Edward Seymour, but the changes that England were to see with regard to faith were mainly orchestrated by Archbishop Cranmer, someone who was committed to religious Protestant change in England. Much of the rituals and processes of Catholic Mass were forbidden and replaced by Protestant services, all of which was implemented throughout the realm with the Books of Common Prayer and Acts of Uniformity in 1549 and 1552. A rebellion would arise from this, known as the Prayer Book Rebellion, and this rebellion, along with another rebellion, known as Ketz Rebellion, would lead to King Edward's uncle, the protector, Edward Seymour, being deposed and effectively replaced by his rival, the, at the time, Earl of Warwick, John Dudley, eventual Duke of Northumberland. Nevertheless, the rebellions were crushed, and the religious changes remained in place. Mary had, as we discussed previously, remained a practicing Catholic despite the religious changes that had been taking place under her father's rule. Due to the fact that her father existed in a kind of middle ground between Catholics and Protestants and had remained dedicated to many of the practices of the old faith, Mary's piety, as we've already touched on, had been previously considered quite normal and accepted. However, with the new changes that were now being implemented and required by law, what Mary was doing was technically illegal. Bishop Gardner, for his pushback and refusals in such matters, would end up in prison for his actions, but Mary returned to her old victim state of mind and refused to submit to these changes or compromise. She insisted that she follow her conscience and be able to continue to observe Catholic Mass as she did when her father had lived. Her brother's counselors became increasingly irritated by her conservative and stubborn attitude, as Mary was using her conscience as a basis to determine which laws she would abide by in which ones she would not. They wrote to her, advising her to be obedient, but again she remained obstinate. She did, however, have the benefit of her cousin, Emperor Charles, as an ally in the matter. Charles leveraged his position in order to guarantee that Mary was able to continue religiously as she had done in the past. In the end, an agreement was reached where Mary was able to observe Mass privately in her chamber with a few servants until her brother came of age and could take control of the situation himself. With the replacement of Edward's uncle, Edward Seymour, by John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, a man far less open to compromise, discussions began to be had about smuggling Mary out of the country. An attempt was made, but when the imperial plotters reached Mary, they found her in a state of chaos, attempting to pack all sorts of possessions for her journey to the continent. She protested that she would not be ready for two days, despite the imperial allies attempting to convince her that the possessions were unnecessary. The plotters were forced to withdraw, with the intention of trying a couple weeks later, but nothing materialized. Mary and her household began to be prodded and harassed, with some of her chaplains being indicted for saying mass, although it should be noted that she often provoked Edward and his council by opening her mass to everyone against the terms of the compromise. The Duke of Northumberland, as we just touched on, was clearly starting to show that he was less willing to compromise with Mary than the protector had been. But this is due in part to the fact that Edward himself was growing in personality and spirit. Edward had taken a hard Protestant stance and was becoming increasingly angry with his obstinate sister, 
although it should be noted that the two remained fond of each other despite their differences. Whether Edward's anger towards his sister was strictly due to his own religious convictions, or whether he simply wished to be obeyed as king, is up for debate. But nevertheless, by the time he turned 13, he began to rebuke Mary himself. Mary had held on to the idea that Edward was simply being misled by his counselors, and that when he became of age, he would see the folly in his Protestant ways. But as Mary began to interact with Edward as he grew, she quickly realized that his convictions would remain against her and her faith. The emperor was coming under increasing pressure internationally, and was not able to fully defend Mary's position. Edward and Warwick finally decided that Mary's mass license would be withdrawn, and a commission was sent to her to declare that no service would be said other than what was approved by law. But Mary again refused, and nothing in the end was accomplished by this, as it was decided that it would be better to let Mary disobey quietly than to make an international scene out of the situation. The ban would never be lifted for her, but it would also never be enforced. The council had realized that unless they were willing to imprison her, there was not much they could do. Mary was received honorably in June 1552 at court, and this was around the time that the second prayer book was implemented. But a change in principle happened around this time for Mary. She seems to have abandoned her arguments toward adhering to her father's church and moved on to arguing for restoring England to Catholic obedience, something that will come up again shortly. But by 1553, it was becoming clear that Edward was sick, and although he had thrown off sicknesses before, this particular sickness would ultimately lead to his unfortunate and painful demise. Edward, of course, by the time the sickness had shown itself, was already dedicated to the Protestant faith, as has been seen, and he did not wish to see all the religious changes that had been implemented during his time as king undone by Mary, who was still next in line to inherit the throne, as Edward had no children. Thus, Edward attempted to undermine his father's succession wishes, and attempted through a document known as the device to bestow the crown to his first cousin once removed, a 15-year-old girl named Jane Grey. The device was thought to have been started prior to Edward's sickness, but after it became clear that he would not survive, this became the main focus of the regime. As we previously discussed, Mary's Father's Succession Act had stated that if all three surviving children were to die childless, that the throne would pass through the lineage of his younger sister, Mary Brandon, and her heirs. Edward and his counselors simply attempted to pass over Mary and Elizabeth and bestow the crown to this line of lineage. Mary Brandon was deceased and had no living sons or grandsons. Thus, Jane Grey was Mary Brandon's eldest granddaughter through her eldest surviving daughter, Frances Grey. Jane Grey was also newly married to the Duke of Northumberland, John Dudley's younger son, Lord Guildford Dudley. Of course, many speculate that it was the influence of Dudley that led to Edward adjusting the succession in favor of his daughter-in-law, but in the light of Edward's growth in personality prior to his death, it is likely that it was Edward himself who pursued these changes. Elizabeth, of course, shared the same religious leanings as Edward, but legitimacy mattered to him and those around him, and she, along with Mary, was still illegitimate by law. Edward's condition continued to deteriorate, and on July 6, 1553, he died. Jane was proclaimed queen upon Mary's brother's death, but to the dismay of Dudley, once word reached Mary, she fled to her power base in the east, initially to Kenninghall, and then to Framlingham. There, more and more people began to gather to her cause. The Duke of Northumberland, John Dudley, set out to capture her, but Mary and her supporters were ready and extremely well prepared. She immediately proclaimed herself queen and wrote to the London councillors demanding submission, while more men began to flock to her banner. Incredibly, the man who had been a staunch supporter in her in the years prior, Emperor Charles, now refused to let his ambassadors act in Mary's interests. Instead, he ordered his men to lay in wait, to watch what happened, and to do business with whoever prevailed, either Northumberland, i.e. Jane Grey, or Mary. Even if Mary appealed to them, they must remain neutral unless Mary was clearly triumphant. But Mary continued to gather support, although sometimes the rate at which she gathered support and the enthusiasm of her supporters is often exaggerated. Of course, some of Mary's support was due to her being Catholic, and surely some saw her as a person who would restore the Catholic faith in England. However, those gathering in her name were not all necessarily there solely due to this, as many in the realm simply distrusted the Duke of Northumberland, or more importantly, wished to see the will of Mary's father honored. 
Soon, Dudley, who was on campaign to capture Mary, found that support for Jane had collapsed in London and that the councillors had proclaimed Mary Queen in his absence once word of her strength reached them. Jane and her supporters, along with Northumberland, simply waited to see what would happen after news of what was transpiring reached them. In hindsight, this was an unwise decision on both of their parts. Dudley would be executed for his role in the attempted sidestepping of the succession and reverted to Catholicism prior to his execution. It was convenient for Mary to put the blame on Dudley, as he was already unpopular, and this also had the added benefit of taking the blame away from her brother, although it is most likely true that he played a major role in the succession dispute. Jane Grey's fate will be discussed shortly. By July, Mary was officially the Queen of England, and not a drop of blood had been spilled to attain her crown. This was a momentous event, as it clearly showed that statutory law held precedence in the mind of the people over the wishes of the monarch. Mary's stressful proclamation may have been bloodless, but her story was far from over, and unfortunately for Mary and many in the realm of England, the future would be dark and infamously bloody. Although Mary had incredibly become queen, against all odds, she had an enormous task ahead of her. When she had declared herself as queen, many were surprised with how quickly her government began to function so quickly. Part of the reason for this was due to the fact that she put together a council to continue government as usual. She had actually formulated a council which consisted of loyal household officers and first supporters prior to the London councillors submitting. This group would become known as the Framlingham Council. This council was greatly lacking political experience, and thus Mary found herself in an interesting position. She needed the political experience of some of the London councillors that were associated with her brother's regime, but also needed to show support and thanks for those who supported her from the Framlingham Council. She decided that she would pardon many of the London councillors and reinstate them, and mix them with the Framlingham Council to form her ultimate governing body. This, in the end, would become a problem, as the two groups remained split in practice, with the Framlingham Council seeing the London councillors as heretics for accepting the religious changes of the previous reign, and the London councillors seeing the Framlingham Council as fools and with no experience or knowledge necessary for their new roles. Nevertheless, in early August 1553, Mary, with her supporters in tow, traveled to London from the east, where the guilty councillors were duly pardoned. She was joined by her sister Elizabeth, north of the city, in a quasi-show of support, although it should be noted that the two half-sisters, as evidenced previously, never truly got along, something that will continue to be a theme throughout the rest of Mary's story. One of Mary's first actions upon entering London was to free the bishops that had been imprisoned by her brother's regime. This obviously included the conservative Bishop of Winchester, Stephen Gardner, who had, as discussed previously, been imprisoned for rejecting the Protestant changes that had been implemented during Edward VI's reign. Bishop Gardner would be made Chancellor and would become an important influence on Mary as Queen. In addition to freeing allies, decisions needed to be made with what to do with the losers of the previous reign. As we have already seen, Dudley was duly executed after reverting to Catholicism. Dudley's son and Jane Grey were convicted and held in the tower. Additionally, leading Protestant bishops were imprisoned for the time being, including Archbishop Cranmer. On October 1st, 1553, Mary was crowned at Westminster Abbey as Queen Mary I of England. Typically, the Archbishop of Canterbury would perform such coronations, but due to the fact that the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time was the imprisoned and Protestant Thomas Cranmer, Bishop Gardiner performed the ceremony. A dispensation was attained in order to have Mary crowned as a Catholic ruler and to celebrate Mass at the coronation. Many knew that Mary was opposed to the religious changes that had been implemented by her half-brother, and although Mary initially took a stance publicly of perceived neutrality, it soon became clear that she intended to make drastic changes with regards to religion. It was assumed by many that she would implement and restore the old Catholic ways in England, and thus, by the time she was proclaimed in London, Many Catholic practices were immediately resumed within the city, despite the fact the Book of Common Prayer was the only way to worship legally. However, the Protestant changes that had been implemented actually did have some considerable support in London, and this, mixed with a couple other unforeseen major changes, 
would lead to unrest in England. Mary, although clearly having intentions to restore Catholicism in England, also was set on repealing the royal supremacy, which had made the English monarch head of the English church. This would, in effect, reinstate the Pope as the supreme being over the English church once again. However, Mary miscalculated, as this is not what most had wanted in England. This is something we will return to. Mary also established close imperial connections, utilizing ambassadors as close advisors, despite their reluctance to help her during the succession crisis. This did not assist her in her relationship with her council, as there was considerable suspicion with regards to outsiders in England at this time. Mary's close relationship with foreign leaders made many in England uneasy, and this would be exacerbated by Mary's marriage prospects. Mary being the first crowned sovereign queen of England was in an interesting and difficult position, and her traditional values of marriage and womanhood only added problems to the situation. Mary could marry an English nobleman, but this very well could revive some sort of conflict similar to the ones known today as the Wars of the Roses. Obviously, no one was keen on seeing any type of civil conflict reemerge in England, but the alternative was just as frightening to many. The idea of Mary marrying a foreign spouse had its own potential consequences, mainly that the lines of leadership and control were not clearly drawn. Would the spouse be a king or a consort? And would his foreign kingdom take precedence over England if he were to become king? Mary remembered her promise not to marry without the emperor's consent. Of course, Charles suggested his own son, the widowed Prince of Spain, Philip, although he was already in marriage negotiations with the Portuguese at this time. But soon it became apparent that Mary desired to marry Philip and Philip only. Philip, for his part, declared his availability, and negotiations began. Philip was a potentially good candidate, as he was clearly of royal lineage, represented a potential alliance with the powerful Habsburgs, and above all, was Catholic. However, he spoke no English and would be hard-pressed to devote much of his time to England due to his other responsibilities. Nevertheless, in October, Mary accepted the emperor's proposal without consulting or informing her council. Mary's marriage will be discussed at length throughout the rest of her story. Parliament met and reinstated Mary's parents' marriage, eliminating her illegitimacy. They also repealed many of the religious reforms that were implemented during Mary's brother's reign including the Acts of Uniformity and Prayer Book, which was made illegal. They also petitioned her to marry within the realm, not knowing that she had already come to an agreement with the Emperor. When word leaked of the Spanish marriage, problems immediately began to form. Many in England were opposed to the marriage discussions, especially some of the members of the Commons, who began to meet secretly to prevent the marriage from taking place. There were also alleged discussions with regard to possibly deposing Mary in favor of her half-sister Elizabeth, although in the end, the abandonment of the Spanish marriage was the main focus. It was well known, however, that selling the Spanish marriage to the people would be a difficult task, but Mary was set in her ways. Propaganda began to be spread, warning of the dangers of returning to the Catholic fray, and also on the black legend, as it is referred to today, of Spanish cruelty. People were warned that they could expect a sort of Spanish Inquisition if Mary was allowed to marry Philip. By early 1554, the secret discussions soon turned to rebellion, which erupted in Kent and was led by a man named Sir Thomas Wyatt. Wyatt's rebellion, as it is known today, was soon crushed, but not before Wyatt and his rebels were able to reach London, and not before Mary herself gave a rousing speech at the London Guildhall. Wyatt, along with many other rebels, was executed as a traitor. Additionally, Lady Jane Grey and her husband, the son of the executed Duke of Northumberland were executed as a result of the rebellion, as Jane's father had been one of the conspirators. Elizabeth was also suspected of conspiring. She was arrested and interrogated, but refused to admit any connection to the rebellion. Although suspected by many, she was never fully implicated in the plot and was spared by her sister, who refused to take action against her without irrefutable evidence. At this point, an important individual must be discussed. This man was an Englishman and had, in the decades prior, caused problems for Mary's father. He was of Yorkist descent, a grandson of George Duke of Clarence, brother to the two Yorkist kings, Edward IV and Richard III. This man had openly opposed the royal supremacy in England and remained steadfast in his dedication to the Pope in Rome. He survived the purging of Yorkist blood by Mary's father by exiling on the continent 
and had been made a cardinal in 1536. He had been appointed by a previous pope to potentially support a rebellion against Mary's father, known as the Pilgrimage of Grace, but had been unsuccessful in this. Nevertheless, after being attainted by Parliament, he remained as a thorn in the side of Mary's father. This man's name was Reginald Pole, and he was appointed by Pope Julius III as papal legate to sort out the religious issues in England. However, an interesting scenario presented itself in England. As has already been discussed, the thought of a foreign king in England was quite concerning to many in itself. But the Pope and Rome were equally considered as foreign by many in this regard, and not only by Protestants. If Philip was allowed to marry Mary I before the Catholic Restoration was implemented, it could have the appearance of a foreign king coming into England to re-implement the foreign Pope as head of the English Church which would have had a detrimental effect on the English church and clergy. Many, specifically Bishop Gardiner, were aware of this and were keen to begin implementing the Catholic Restoration prior to Philip marrying the Queen. On the other hand, the most serious issue with the Catholic Restoration was the issue of ecclesiastical lands, which had been seized by Mary's father and brother with the dissolution of the monasteries. The Pope and individuals such as Reginald Pole would surely expect that this land should be reconfiscated from the layman and returned to the churchmen, which had the potential to make for serious unrest in England. Many laymen, regardless of their religious beliefs, felt that they had earned the lands and had paid fair market price for them, and thus were not eager to relinquish these back to the church. Emperor Charles and the imperialists, for their part, wanted to prevent this from Mary's protection, but they also wished to see the marriage take place prior to the Catholic Restoration beginning. Thus, Charles actively prevented Reginald Pole from returning to England. Pole had also been attainted by Mary's father, and this needed to be dealt with as well. Thus, once the second parliament met, Bishop Gardner attempted to resolve the issues with regard to the royal supremacy. The bill that was presented passed the Commons, but failed in the House of Lords, as some were sympathetic to the Emperor, and some were most likely concerned on losing their rights to property they had acquired. After the bill was rejected, Mary was outraged and the topic remained unresolved. Philip soon finally set sail for England, landing in July 1554 at Southampton. Mary and Philip finally met one another and were married by Bishop Gardiner on July 25, 1554, shortly thereafter at Winchester Cathedral. Emperor Charles, as a wedding gift, made Philip King of Naples, Sicily, and Jerusalem, making Philip now equal in status to his bride. A new type of quasi-dual monarchy was now to be tested throughout the kingdom. Competition was unsurprisingly in the air with regards to Spanish and English attendants, but although the idea of the Spanish marriage was quite unpopular, and many feared being subject to a foreign king, Philip was generally well received by the crowds. The fact that Mary could now produce an heir, and the idea that a man was now in a position to handle some of the governmental issues put many at ease. Although Philip would never be crowned, something that he eventually would take serious issue with, he began to take an active role in government immediately, despite the limitations laid out in the marriage treaty. A new future was laying in wait for Mary and England, but unfortunately for both, this future would be less than ideal. Mary after the marriage seemed to be at peace, something that she had not experienced often in her past and would find it difficult to achieve in the future. Protestantism seemed to be devoid of any long-term future in England. She was married and all was well enough in order throughout the kingdom. Philip, for his part, had two serious things to oversee. Number one, he needed to produce an heir. And number two, he needed to oversee the Catholic restoration as he, his father, and their kingdoms were squarely of the Catholic belief and needed England to return to the Catholic fray for obvious reasons. In the first respect, the relationship between Philip and Mary was good, and it was not long before Mary began speaking about being pregnant. Rumors spread quickly, which was well received by many, despite the fact that any child born would be three quarters Spanish. But in the second respect, issues soon arose. The marriage treaty eliminated Philip's ability to grant offices, and his counselors and courtiers were unsurprisingly not happy about this. Add to this the fact that he had not been crowned, nor given any English resources, it was becoming clear that a distaste was beginning to grow in the Spanish minds. The issue of the ecclesiastical lands still lay unresolved, and Philip was well aware that if and when Cardinal Pole returned, he would surely, without any political finesse, demand the return of the stolen property. 
After Pohl agreed to surrender discretion on the matter to Philip with the Pope's approval, a parliament was called and Pohl was finally invited back to England. The repeal of his act of attainder was rushed through prior to his arrival. A committee was formed to repeal the acts of supremacy, but to do it with the property rights of laymen in mind. Philip was the main driver behind this and was instrumental in forming the legislation that would see the property rights of laymen protected by statute law. Cardinal Pohl was unsurprisingly opposed to this, and initially Mary agreed with him over her husband. But Philip was able to convince her otherwise, and by January 1555, a bill had passed in the Lords and Commons with the Pope giving way. Additionally, the heresy laws that had been implemented by Mary's father and repealed by her brother were reenacted. This meant that the persecution of Protestants could now fully take effect. The Protestant bishops that had been imprisoned, including Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, could very well have been tried for treason and executed. However, Mary specifically had wished for the men to be tried on heresy charges, and this could not be done until a reconciliation was reached with Rome and heresy laws reenacted. With this now accomplished, it was time for the Protestants to pay the price. Gardner and Pohl moved against the Protestants soon after Parliament was dissolved. Many imprisoned preachers were summoned and required to submit and receive Mary's mercy or be condemned. The method of execution was to be burning alive, in line with historical punishment for heretics first seen during the reign of Henry IV. Most of the preachers refused, and on February 4, 1555, John Rogers, after publicly refusing the Queen's pardon, became the first English Protestant burned for heresy during Mary's reign. The conservative bishops were taken aback. They had expected all the Protestants to conform under the threat of death by fire. Although some surely did, the number of Protestants that remained defiant was surprising to them. The burnings were initially targeted towards higher status individuals in hopes to deter the lower ranking supporters from remaining defiant. This worked in certain places, but overall this did not have the desired effect. Soon lower born members were facing the flames as well, especially in Essex, Kent, and London. Although the crowds that attended the burnings may not have been sympathetic to the beliefs of those being burned, it is believed that the burnings were unpopular with all in the kingdom. Philip attempted to change this and believed that the burning would lead to more dissent if it could not be used as a proper deterrent. Bishop Gardner eventually agreed with him, but Cardinal Pohl and Mary remained dedicated to the practice. Between 1555 and 1558, over 300 men and women were burned alive under Mary's leadership due to their relapsed heretical ideals. And because of this, Mary over time developed the nickname to which she is so famously remembered today, Bloody Mary. Almost all the imprisoned bishops discussed previously suffered the same fate. Archbishop Cranmer is one to specifically note. He recanted his Protestant beliefs, which would have, in theory, prevented him from having to suffer execution by burning. But Mary was adamant in Cranmer's case and pushed heavily for him to be burned as she had held a grudge against him for his transgressions past. He would be burned, although not until 1556, after being forced to watch his fellow Protestant bishops suffer the same fate first. Executing Cranmer was a foolish thing to do on Mary's part, as his recantations would have all but destroyed his legacy. But now, he had nothing to lose. Cranmer stood up to Mary yet again and recanted his recantations against Protestantism. He famously declared that his hand, which had signed the recantations and thus committed the sin, should burn first. On the day of his execution, he made good this promise and raised his hand to the flame before the flames had a chance to reach the rest of his body. Thus, instead of a failed and recanted reformer, he died a memorable martyr and cemented his Protestant legacy. After Cranmer's execution, he was replaced as Archbishop of Canterbury by Cardinal Pohl himself. It seemed as though Mary, despite her limitations, was proving to be reasonably strong and brutal in her position, but soon this was all to change dramatically. By the time Mary had married the 26-year-old Philip in 1554, she was 37 years old, and thus an attempt to produce an heir was needed quickly. By November of that year, as we have seen, it was being proclaimed that Mary was pregnant not long after Philip arrived in England. The following spring she went into confinement at Hampton Court in anticipation of the birth of a child. However, by August, to Mary's embarrassment and disappointment, no child arrived, and scandalous rumors began to spread. Mary, of course, remained hopeful that a child would arrive, 
but eventually she was forced to admit that the experience was a false alarm to her utter dismay. Whether the phantom pregnancy was just Mary's imagination running wild due to her intense desire to have a child and heir, or whether her poor health was a contributing factor to this can never be truly known. Whatever the case, by the time the pregnancy was revealed to be false, Philip's mind began to shift, as it was becoming clear that Mary would have no child. Philip unfortunately had other issues to tend to within his own realms, specifically the fact that his father, the Emperor's health, was deteriorating and it would soon be time for him to take over control, and the fact that he and or his father was at war with the French, something that will be discussed shortly. Philip left England and set out for the continent to deal with these other pressing issues, but made arrangements to keep in touch with Mary and to be kept in the loop about English affairs. Reginald Pohl was privately instructed by Philip to look out for Mary's well-being. Philip's departure and the death of Bishop Gardner in November 1555 greatly distressed Mary, who continued to correspond with her husband and begged him to return regularly. Philip would end up taking over the duties in the Low Countries as well as in Spain by early 1556 as the emperor retired from his positions. Another important death had occurred in March 1555, which would have lasting consequences. Pope Julius III, who had been instrumental in the Catholic Restoration in England, died and was replaced by Pope Paul IV. This was unfortunate, as Paul was abjectly anti-Habsburg and would cause many future problems, as we will soon see. Mary began to decline and continually attempted to convince her husband to return, to no avail. Harvests had been bad, Protestant burnings was provoking demonstrations, and a plot to replace Mary with Elizabeth, known as the Dudley Plot, was uncovered. Pope Paul IV began harassing imperial supporters within the Curia and began replacing them with pro-French supporters. Cardinal Pohl was no longer able to exercise his role as papal mediator due to him becoming Archbishop of Canterbury. However, the most glaring issue that many were focused on in the council was that Philip would certainly attempt to bring England into the war with France. In short, the last Italian war had begun in 1551 when the French king Henry II declared war on Philip's father, Emperor Charles, with the intent of recapturing Italy and becoming the dominant force in European affairs. This war is complex in its own respect and will not be discussed in detail, but it is important to note that the conflict existed between the French and the Habsburgs, aka Emperor Charles and Mary's husband, Philip. Unsurprisingly, the English counselors, save a select few, were opposed to English entrance into this war. But Mary saw an opportunity to convince her husband to return and thus was keen on the idea. Philip, realizing that the only way he could get England into the war was to return to Mary, did so, landing in England in March 1557. When Philip returned, he found the Church of England well enough in order, and much of the Catholic doctrinal infrastructure had been reinstated. But he also found that the Protestant persecution was taking on newer levels of oppression. The burnings had moved from mainly higher-ranking church officials down to include occupations such as weavers, agricultural workers, and serving maids. Crowds were becoming more and more hostile, and although many of the administering bishops began to hesitate, Mary pushed them to continue on with their practices. This was unneeded attention and a potential hotbed for unrest against Mary and Cardinal Pole. Propagandists also pushed to link the persecutions with Spanish influence, and this was aided by rumors of the now 42-year-old Mary's failing health, concerning to some due to the fact that in their minds, Mary's death could lead to an unchecked Spanish authority in England and or a dispute between Elizabeth and Philip. Discussion about England's entry into the war remained deadlocked until the partially ruined and weakly garrisoned castle of Scarborough was taken by a man named Thomas Stafford with French assistance. Stafford declared that Mary was no queen due to her handing over the realm to foreigners. Stafford was easily defeated, but this was enough for the counselors opposed to entering the war to relent and agree to Philip and Mary's demands. Henry II of France denied involvement in the plot, and this very well may have been true, as Henry was most likely not inclined to bring England into the war. Philip, now attaining what he desired, quickly headed to Dover to leave England for the last time. He would never see Mary again. Another claim was made by Mary that she believed herself to be pregnant, but this, like the last phantom pregnancy, was false. Interestingly, Philip saw the writing on the wall and was well aware of the unlikeliness of Mary producing children. Thus, although Philip had previously regarded Elizabeth as a serious threat, 
he now changed his tune. Yes, his trip to England was intended to bring England into the war, which he had been successful, but he also attempted to force Elizabeth into marriage while in England in order to be able to control her. This endeavor had failed, as Elizabeth knew full well what he was up to, but Philip was still keen on keeping friendly relations with Elizabeth and would support her if he had to, due to the fact that even if he lost his influence in England when his wife died, Elizabeth becoming queen was a much better prospect than that of the other main claimant to the English throne, Mary Stuart, aka Mary Queen of Scots, who had strong French ties. Mary surely was not happy about this, but there was little she could do. Church issues were becoming worrisome in England as well by this point. Cardinal Pole began to come under suspicion of Lutheran, i.e. heretical tendencies, and was recalled by Pope Paul. Despite Pole, Mary, and Philip all writing to Paul, protesting the recall, he remained obstinate in his position. Pole would have surely been investigated for heretical leanings should he have departed, and Pole was torn on the issue. Should it have been left to him, he probably would have returned to Rome to face the charges and would have ended up in prison, but Mary and Philip forbade him from going. He remained in England and continued his reform program. Eventually, however, the Pope would be forced out of the war, and England had still yet to play their part in the conflict. When Philip left England, he was accompanied by an English expeditionary force, which played a perhaps minimal role in campaigning. After the Habsburg victory at the Battle of Saint-Quentin, winter approached and the English troops were being sent home. The English council, having decided that the campaigning season was over for the year, left the garrison of Calais greatly depleted. Calais was the last English possession on the continent and had been famously captured by the glorious English king Edward III centuries prior. This was a monumental mistake. Philip and his forces at Saint-Quentin were too strong to attack, but when Henry II learned of the depleted forces at Calais, he decided to move against it. This information is believed to have reached Philip, the governor of Calais, and indeed the English council. By the time they began to gather a force to strengthen the stronghold, it was too late. Calais was attacked and fell to the French, thus eliminating England's last foothold on the continent. Mary was distraught at the loss of Calais and was alleged to have said, When I am dead and opened, you shall find Calais lying in my heart. The loss of Calais wasn't necessarily all bad. It was extremely expensive to maintain, but on a moral level, the loss was devastating to many. Philip was quickly blamed for the debacle, although the depletion of the garrison fell to the council's money-saving interests. It was also believed that the garrison had been sold out by heretics and, unsurprisingly, led to further religious persecution of Protestants. Things had taken a dramatic and unfortunate turn for the worse for Mary, but soon another issue would come to the forefront, her failing health. By the time Philip departed England, Mary retreated into her shell after returning to London. The woman who had once taken great joy in gambling, hunting, and hawking could now not be bothered by such things. She could have been in depression, or could have been in declining health before anyone noticed, but she was clearly different after Philip had left a second time. The war effort was ran by her council, and it seemed that she was inclined to let the machine that she had built do its job. Her second phantom pregnancy and elevation of Protestant burnings of six or seven people at a time has led some to believe that she was losing touch with reality. She slept badly and was becoming ever weaker. The prospect of having a child was clearly gone and her bitterness grew as she was forced to come to terms with this uncomfortable situation. But as she became acutely aware of the harsh reality that presented itself, that is, that she would remain childless, she realized that something had to be done for the future. Mary offered to put the succession issue to Parliament perhaps in an attempt to repeal her father's succession act in which Elizabeth was heir. Mary had remained hostile towards her half-sister and had always looked at her as illegitimate. Philip attempted in the spring of 1558 again to marry Elizabeth off, but again failed as Elizabeth expressed no desire to marry at all. But she did show gratitude for Philip's support and showed a willingness to continue carrying on a positive relationship with the Spanish and imperial leader after she became queen. With Philip's recognition and support in England, Elizabeth now became the focus of the future and there was not much Mary could do about it. Of course, Elizabeth remained of the Protestant belief and thus 
Mary faced the same prospects that her brother did years prior, that all the religious change that had been implemented by her would be undone with the coming of her sibling to the throne. By May 1558, Mary was extremely sick. She was able to throw off her sickness, but by late September, she was ill again. Many begged Philip to return to England to assist his sick wife, but he had by that time cut his losses in England and refused. He had already accepted Elizabeth as the heir. It was not until October that Mary finally adjusted her will to acknowledge that it was unlikely that she would produce children and finally acknowledge Elizabeth as heir, although she intentionally did not refer to Elizabeth by name. A few days later, she sent a message to Elizabeth confirming her right to the throne. Mary continued to grow weaker until on November 17, 1558, the 42-year-old Queen Mary I of England slipped into a coma and died surrounded by her loyal associates. The religious persecution of Protestants came to an immediate halt. Interestingly, Cardinal Pole, a prime mover of said religious persecutions and a main architect of the Catholic Restoration, died the same day as his queen and would not have to face the consequences that he would have surely faced under Elizabeth, who was proclaimed queen the same morning Mary died. Mary's body laid in state for around a month before being moved to Westminster Abbey. She was buried on December 14th in her grandfather Henry VII's chapel. Elizabeth eventually would be laid to rest next to her sister upon her death, and both of these tombs can be seen at Westminster Abbey to this day. The reign of Mary I is no doubt a reign that should be looked upon with reservation and contemplation. From her youth, Mary seemingly lived an overall stressful and difficult life, with her parents' divorce, her medical ailments, the intimidation and forced acknowledgement of her illegitimacy, and the difficult relationship with her father. As she grew, things appear to have continued somewhat along these lines, as she was harassed by her brother and his counselors, forced into celibacy, and was nearly deprived of her legal right to the crown. Even after Mary became queen, the unfortunate events and stressors continued to arise, with phantom pregnancies, rebellion and plots, and pushback to her Spanish marriage, all of which took place under the shadow of her being the first true queen of England in her own right. Her reputation has suffered throughout the centuries, and given many of her actions, this criticism is perhaps at least in part well-founded and deserved. A certain degree of responsibility certainly deserved to be placed at her feet for the persecution of the Protestants in England and for some of the poor choices she made as queen, perhaps even the loss of Calais. But in modern times, it has been argued that the idea that she was an undereducated fool whose religious convictions and traditional ideas of womanhood prevented her from exercising proper power as a monarch has been exaggerated. Of course, some of this argued exaggeration can be attributed to the fact that Mary's failures were surely highlighted by the propaganda of her successor, nemesis and half-sister Elizabeth. And since Elizabeth did well during her time as queen, it is not surprising that Mary's negative reputation has stuck over the centuries. But we must remember that Elizabeth had the benefit of becoming queen at a much younger age and with Mary's difficulties in mind. She also lived a considerably longer life than her elder sister did, and this allowed her more time to succeed in the role of queen. Many forget that Mary was only queen for five years, a very short time frame for any leader of any nation at any time in history to attempt to successfully accomplish anything. If she had been younger when she had become queen or had lived longer, would she be remembered differently than she is today? This we can never know, but the harsh reality remains in that Mary was a failure as a queen. The Catholic restoration that she so seriously pursued would eventually be undone, and the unpopular and heinous persecutions arguably did more damage to her cause than helped it, as did her choice in a Spanish marriage. However, perhaps an aspect of Mary's life that should not be overlooked is the fact that, despite the utter disdain she felt for her sister, and despite the fact that she knew that all she had worked for would most likely be undone, she swallowed the bitter pill of acknowledging Elizabeth as heir, and thus did her part to secure a peaceful and bloodless succession upon her death. Unfortunately, no matter how many times Mary's life may be re-evaluated, and no matter the arguments that may arise today or in the future, attempting to defend her or bring to light her actions in some positive way, Mary will forever be remembered for the horrible happenings that took place under her watch. For this, she will most likely forever remain, whether right or wrong, as England's first queen, Bloody Mary.